Well, good morning, everybody. This is Cruise Man. Another edition of Coffee and Comments. Now, this is where I take some time to read the emails and messages that you've left on YouTube or Facebook. And just going to go through some of the things that you guys have uh, messaged me since the last Coffee and Comments. I got my coffee here. It's Monday morning. <clears throat> it's early, so my voice is still not 100%, so forgive me. Anyway, I want to welcome you to my YouTube channel if you haven't been here before. And um, this is just a, a time I do about once a month, every you know four, five, six weeks. Depends on how many comments I get and which ones I think uh, should be addressed publicly. But, uh, you know, I probably get, I don't know, a couple hundred comments a day. And a lot of them are pretty repetitious, but uh, some of them stand out. And these, these are the ones that uh, I'm going to talk about today. So the first one is from Trevor Baldwin. And uh, he says, hello from Newfoundland, Canada. I recently purchased a 2019 Goldwing Tour DCT from a dealer in Ontario and had it shipped here. I've been wanting a 2018 since they came out. Absolutely love it. Are you aware the radio reception is not great? Any suggestions for an antenna? I would prefer not to have to install a whip type. A uh, common problem, Trevor. Uh, the AM FM reception on the uh, sixth generation Goldwing is abysmal. I didn't know how bad it was. I knew it was bad, but I didn't know how bad it was until I did a road trip, uh, which many of you know I go to uh, West Texas a couple times a year. And at Christmas time, I went in our in our car in our Lexus, and I was listening to the same AM radio station I listen to all the time. Now, normally on the motorcycle, that station will cut out at about Weatherford, which is maybe 65, 70 miles from here. I was able to pick up that radio station all the way to Sweetwater, Texas, which is, gosh, maybe 200 miles from here. I couldn't even believe it was able to pick it up. But it was certainly picking it up on the other side of Abilene, which is about 170 miles from here. And that just kind of uh, emphasized how bad the antenna and the radio reception is on this Goldwing. It's pretty abysmal. As far as an antenna solution, um, a, friend of I, a friend of mine and I, I have tried a couple of different uh, aftermarket antennas and nothing we've found so far has worked. Now these are things we've gotten off Amazon. I was hoping to be able to install an antenna behind the passenger uh, seat backrest and maybe that would improve the reception, but I really haven't found anything yet that has worked. So it's a very easy thing to do because the antenna connection is under the seat right there on the audio unit. But I just haven't found one that really does, any, you know, really makes an improvement. If any of you out there have, have come up with a solution for the AM FM reception, now XM radio seems to work fine. Uh, at least mine did back when I had it. I don't have it turned on anymore, but back when I had the service, it seemed to be pretty good reception. But the AM FM is really, really bad. So if any of you have a solution for this, if you've come up with anything better, uh, put it in the comments down below. We'd really like to know about it. Next comment is from James Erb, and it's regarding the uh, Skosh Jump Starter. Hello, Cruise Man. My name's James. I write it 08 GL 1800. Enjoy your videos. Respect your opinion. Uh, purchased the Skosh 700 after seeing my video. Bike was in for maintenance, and I asked my tech if he would install the harness for the unit, but he refused because it did not have an inline fuse and said it could be a fire risk. He said anything connected directly to the battery should have a fuse. That's what the tech said. I really like the idea of having it connected to the battery because it's next to impossible to get the alligator clips on the post. What do you think? Ah, the harness that comes with this uh, connector kit for the Skosh does not have a fuse, but the pigtail that goes to your battery tender or whatever charger you choose to use 
does have a fuse. So even though the two wires connected to the battery don't have a fuse, as soon as you plug it into that pigtail, that pigtail does have a fuse. So it, ultimately it is a fused connection. Um, so that's just how I would answer that. And any of you, if you, any of you have had that question, uh, that should resolve that issue. Now this uh, next message or, or question is from jka one I think I'm saying that right. Since the big redesign, I hear four complaints. This is a message he posted on my 2021 Goldwing review. Number one, the front suspension bottoms out too easily. The GPS software is pretty crappy. The storage compartment door over the gas tank is hard to open. And the seat is inadequately padded and tends to gather, forming a hard, uncomfortable line. Does anybody else agree? Um, not sure I agree with the first one about the suspension bottoming out too easily. Now, I can only go from my own experience. I weigh about 185 pounds, and I've only had my suspension bottom out maybe three or four times since I've owned the bike. It just happened to me recently on this road trip to West Texas because there was a part of the road that had a pretty bad pothole in it, and when I hit that pretty deep pothole, it did bottom out the front suspension. Now, if you saw my review video of the 2021 and the 2020, uh, you probably remember there's this one section of highway where I'm going over an overpass and I hear a clunk, and I assumed that was the front suspension bottoming out. Someone posted a message, and I believe they're probably correct, that the noise I was hearing was probably the seam in the highway. Maybe there was a, a loose something or other there in that seam, and when I hit that, that's what was causing the noise. That makes more sense because it was a very, very mild bump. I didn't hardly even feel it. I just heard it. So I don't think on that review test ride uh, that the suspension was actually bottoming out. I think it was just a seam in the road that was making that noise. Uh, GPS software, pretty crappy. Um, I would say it's probably comparable to what you would get in an automobile GPS. It's okay, like I've said in the past, if you just simply want to go, if you're in a strange town and you're trying to find a gas station, or if you're trying to find a place to eat, or if you want to go from point A to point B as quickly as possible, and it's going to put you on an interstate to get there, it's okay. It was obviously designed for car use. It was not designed uh, for what a motorcyclist would want. It's very difficult to program with custom routes. It can be done, but it's not, it's not perfect. It's just, it's just a clunky interface and a clunky system. And it could, it, it really, they really should have gone with Garmin because Garmin knows what they're doing on these types of things. But they didn't. So I would agree with you on number two. Um, the storage compartment door over the gas tank, I think he's referring to the uh, center pocket or what most people refer to as the glove box. It can be tough to open, but once you figure out the little secret of hitting it on the right side of the button, it, it comes open okay. Um, but yeah, until you figure out how to do it. So I don't think that's a huge issue. Uh, the, as far as the seat, I've never had mine gather and form a hard, uncomfortable line. Uh, it is inadequately padded. I will agree with that. And it, it could certainly be better. Uh, but I do know that this is a common problem on most factory OEM seats, motorcycles. That's why all these companies make aftermarket seats. So it's not just the Goldwing that has this problem. Coming from a 2012 Goldwing, though, you really notice it because that was an extremely comfortable seat out of the box. Uh, probably the most comfortable stock OEM seat uh, that I've seen. I know that when, years ago when I had a Sportster, I replaced the seat on it because it was very uncomfortable out of the box. So not that unusual, but I agree with you for a touring bike this price point, Honda could probably do a lot to improve that seat. I think what they're trying to do is keep the padding down so that shorter riders with shorter legs can their feet can reach the ground. For someone like me, I'm six foot one, an extra inch or two of padding would be fine for me. I, in fact, I'd prefer to sit up a little higher anyway, so it's not a huge deal. Okay, so that's, that's that. Uh, Edward Keller says, Chris, your trunk is open. Not sure what video this was on. Um, 
he probably saw the light. It was probably one of my motive logs, and I'm sure he saw the light on my dash where it showed the trunk was open and maybe even the right saddlebag. I've been having an issue over the last couple of weeks where I'm getting that message on the dash, even though the trunk and the right saddlebag are completely closed. I have not traced down this issue yet, but even when the saddlebag is closed on the right side, I get that light showing that, you know, the little emblem showing that the saddlebag is still open. Uh, if any of you have had this problem on your saddlebag or trunk, would you please let me know in the comments? If you found a resolution, please put that in there as well. Um, I'm assuming, not sure, but I'm assuming it's the switch when you close the saddlebag. There's a little switch in there that must make a contact from that latch to let it know it's closed. And I'm assuming either that switch is defective or it's out of alignment. I'm not sure. I've never removed that mechanism, so I don't think it's anything I've done. Um, I will say it's intermittent. It does not happen all the time. And I can be going down the road and I will not see that warning light. And then out of nowhere, it'll just pop up and start flashing. Sometimes it's the trunk open in the right saddlebag. Sometimes it's just the right saddlebag. But um, I've even had it where I'll, re I'll reach back when I'm stopped and you know close the trunk on the passenger backrest and the right saddlebag light will go out. Very weird. So... I'm not really sure what's going on. I, like I say, I haven't taken the time yet to trace this down. So if any of you have had these uh, open saddlebag, open trunk lights come on um, for no reason, let me know in the comments. So thank you, Edward, for that, that note. Now we're going to go to Robert Dunn. And he says, Cruz, could a guy buy a Honda Goldwing standard, meaning a non-tour, and just install a top box. I don't usually have a passenger and don't listen to music while riding. Well, even if you do listen to music, you get music through the front speakers on a standard Goldwing. You can do this. You can buy the top box separately and add it to a non-tour model. However, the way it comes from Honda is a pain in the ass. They made it just about as complicated as they would. You got to undo a lot of bolts you got to take a lot of stuff off. It's really ridiculous the way they designed it. I don't know why they did that. But it's not as simple as just taking your trunk and popping it in a latch and a couple latches and, and be on your way like it should be. You might want to check, if you plan on doing this, you might want to check with Max at Traction Dynamics. I know they make a, a like a quick release for the for the after or for, or for the Honda OEM trunk to go on the the model on the uh, non-tour model, I'm pretty sure they make that, and I think it reduces the amount of time it takes to get the trunk on and off considerably. I but I have not used it, haven't seen it, haven't installed it. But if you plan on doing this and you're like, let's say you're going to ride with a trunk on a long trip, but then when you come home, you're going to want to take it off, and you don't want to spend an hour getting that trunk off. I would check with Max at Traction Dynamics and ask him about this quick release mechanism that they've developed. Okay. Enrique, I'm not even going to try the last name, Men Mendizabal. Did I say that right? Enrique, he was watching my review video of the 2020 Goldwing, and he asked, why do you think Honda might stop producing the Goldwing? Um, it's just a... Uh, it's just a, a fear. It's just a concern. Uh, you, nothing's guaranteed when it comes to these things. We, we, you know, a lot of people with the previous generation Goldwing thought that if Honda came out with another Goldwing, it was going to have a bigger trunk and bigger saddlebags. And it turned out everything was smaller. Nobody saw that coming. So uh, it's the market is changing. Um, I don't think as many people are riding motorcycles now in the United States anyway as they were, say, 20, 30 years ago. A lot of the tour, touring market uh, customers, you might say, are getting to the age where they can no longer ride a motorcycle. That's why you see so many Honda Goldwing trikes. And um, I think what's going to happen, and we're going to talk about this in another video where I'm going to talk about the 2022 Goldwing. 
especially in our current economic situation. I think inflation is going to come into play. I didn't know that when I made this video, but I think what we've seen just in the last three or four or five months, uh, inflation is getting ready to really explode. It already has. And I think the cost of a gold wing could be so prohibitive that there just won't be much of a market for a, a $40,000 motorcycle. But we're going to go into that on my talk about the 2022 Goldwing in the next few days. So I'm going to save that. But anyway, that's my reasoning, mostly because I think the market is shrinking. Uh, even though I would say that 2018 plus Goldwing appears to be doing very well, uh, appears to be selling pretty well. Now, the last thing I'm going to talk about, this comes from Dave in Utah. He's been asking me to mention this for the last few motovlogs and coffee and comments. If this has to do with the Texas driver's license, and I want to know if your state does the same thing. If you look at the back of a Texas driver's license, there's actually a, a little piece of text up there at the top that talks about roadside assistance and an 800 number. Has anybody ever used that? I don't know if you're if you're from Texas. Maybe you can respond to this. I didn't even know that number existed. Dave pointed this out to a friend of mine who pointed it out to me. I didn't even know that number existed. I'm assuming it's a state-run phone where they'll call a tow truck for you, but you still have to pay for it. I don't know. Um, do you have that on your state driver's license or whatever country you're from? If a lot of people watching this are from the UK or Italy or wherever, I mean, we have a worldwide audience now. So it'd be interesting to know, do you have that on the back of your driver's license? Do you have a toll-free number that you can call for roadside assistance? Just be curious to know. So anyway, that's about it for this week's Coffee and Comments. I'm going to probably change the format up slightly on this in the next video we do. So I appreciate your comments. If you like this, I'm sorry about my voice. It's just crap this morning. I don't know what's going on. <clears throat> some days I just, I just, it's like I'm losing my voice, but some days it takes me till noon to get my voice going. I apologize. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up because that really does help us with the YouTube rankings. It lets more people see this video and more people come to the channel. Don't forget to share the video on your social media, email, whatever you do. And don't forget to check the next Cruise Man's Coffee and Comments, my motor vlogs, and my other videos. And I will see you in the next Coffee and Comments.